Let's recap for a second. Last week we talked about how God breathed into Paul. Paul writes to Timothy. Timothy instructs the church at Ephesus. And he starts with this controversial thought of women who have come from the temple of Diana into the culture of the church at Ephesus and are preaching falsehood and are taking over the authority of the church. And Paul urges them two things. These women within the church at Ephesus needed to stop. And what's more is Paul calls on the men of the church to take their spot and to lead well. And then he leaves us in this cliffhanger of thought into the next big thought. And that's the offices that God ordained in the church. I want you to know something, that as we walk through it, you're going to find yourself asking some big questions. And maybe you've read this passage before and you haven't solved the answers. I want you to know something today. We'll find some definites and then we're going to be left with some questions that Scripture lands on either side of. So with that in mind, let's prepare our hearts in prayer and let's ask that God would speak over us and use this crazy guy up here to faithfully handle the Word of God this morning. Before we begin, would you, right where you are, just bow your head and close your eyes, and would you pray for you? Would you pray for the cleansing of your sin, that God would prepare your heart to hear from him? Would you do that right where you are? Next, ask, would you pray for me, that I would faithfully hold the word of God in truth? Last, would you pray for people in this room that you may know or not know, would you pray that they too would hear from Jesus today? Jesus, we need you today. We need you fully spiritually for the forgiveness of sins, for the leadership of our life that we desperately need. And we also need your Holy Spirit to use the Word of God to faithfully speak over us. And Lord, attune our ears to what your Spirit's saying. And Lord, change our lives with it. We pray this in your holy and precious name, the name of Jesus. Amen. First Timothy 3, if you want to open your Bibles with me. First Timothy chapter 3, we're going to read verses 1 through 13. Paul doesn't stop in his thought. He's going to go directly from what's happening at the church at Ephesus into the offices of the church that God ordained. You're going to see throughout Scripture words like overseer or bishop or in Revelation, the angels at the church. Um, All of these words have a particular home in this office, this first office of overseer. You may read it in Scripture As Paul writes to the elders of the churches, uh, same word. It's the same office as an overseer, a spiritual advisor, a leader of the Word of God within a group or a body of believers. And I want to caution you that what we're going to hear is needed today probably more than ever, especially in the office of this overseer, elder, pastor. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 says, This saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to be an overseer, he desires a noble work. An overseer, therefore, must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, self-controlled, sensible, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not an excessive drinker, not a bully but gentle, not quarrelsome, not greedy. He must manage his own household completely and have his children under control with all dignity. If anyone does not know how to manage his own household, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a new convert, or he might become conceited and incur the same condemnation as the devil. Therefore, he must have a good reputation among outsiders, so that he does not fall into disgrace in the devil's trap. Deacons, likewise, should be worthy of respect, not hypocritical, not drinking a lot of wine, not greedy for money, not withholding the mystery of faith with a clear conscience. Um... Oh, pardon me, holding the mystery of faith with a clear conscience. They must also be tested first. If they prove blameless, then they can serve as deacons. Wives, too, must be worthy of respect, not slanders, self-controlled, faithful in everything. 
Deacons are to be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own households completely. Those who have served well as deacons acquire a good standing for themselves and great boldness in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. I asked Scott to put up a, a graphic on the screen. Take a look at it with me. Um, I just took the offices and kind of labeled them, if you will. Um, knowing that there's a few things that we can get from this passage. Uh, one is we have some qualifications. Both overseer and deacon should be the husband of one wife. It gives that being self-controlled in the qualifications should be an overseer and the wife in this passage, and we'll get to that. Sensible, respectable, you can see the list here. It's all from this passage. Uh, flip to the next one for me, the next screen. This is the rest of them. Uh, managing their own household, uh, overseer and, and deacon. Or a good reputation with outsiders, the same thing. Uh, you can see that the deacon has some requirements that are scriptural. Um, and then the wife in this passage, this woman, can't be slanderous and has to be faithful in everything. You can see that these offices require a lot. And I want you to know something from this passage that we can take from the very get-go. Um, first is this, not every man is fit for leadership in the church. Um, I think sometimes in this thought pattern of where Paul's come from with women and their role within the church, we go directly into, this is a trustworthy saying, that he who seeks um, the office of overseer desires noble work. And I think this is the problem that we see in our culture, that there is many men who have entered into the pastorship of churches without any qualification. By the way, I want you to understand that there is absolute good evidence that people should train themselves thoroughly in the Word. To stand before you, they should be students of the Word. They should never give up on that. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.15 tells us this, to be diligent to present ourselves to God as a workman approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, correctly teaching the Word of truth. Um, we'll get to that passage in the coming month, but I want you to know that Paul even gives this instruction to Timothy to not finish his study, to never be done, to never feel like you've arrived, but to study and to dig in and to show yourself a workman that doesn't have to be ashamed when presenting the truth of the Word of God. Now, I want you to know, there's not a pastor in this world that has gotten Scripture 100% right. There's not one. Because there is not a divine pastor. We're all broken vessels preaching on behalf of the Holy Spirit's instruction upon our lives. So that means this, if you've been with me for any amount of time, you have heard me preach incorrectly. And maybe you don't know that, but I've done it. And I found myself in my office watching the, the, the sermon back and going, oh my goodness, I blew that. I, I can't believe I said that. That's incorrect. And I'm so thankful for dear brothers and sisters who come to me after church and go, hey, uh, pastor, love you, mean it. That was wrong. And y'all may think that I hate that, but I got to tell you what I do up here matters. Not because I want to be puffed up and glorified, but you as a hearer needs to hear the truth of the word of God and not my opinions, not my thoughts or my ways. You need to hear from Jesus. So you don't need my ways. You don't need my thoughts on how you should live. You need Christ's ways and the ways he thinks you should live. And when I get in the way of that, I need correction and discipline. Any pastor that stands before you and says, you can't challenge me when I preach the word of God, is not a student of the word of God. We desire to be changed and equipped. And you as the body of believers at the church at Quell Creek need to hold me accountable to the truth of the word of God. It matters. It matters. Any pastor that won't be changed, even by the people he serves and loves, misses the qualifications of overseer. Amen. It's wrong. And so when we look at this passage, we must understand that the conduct of an overseer matters in private and in public. It matters as an overseer that you live out your faith, not only in private, which should be the best of us, but also in public. We as a pastor, I as your pastor, we the ministers at the church at Quell Creek, should be living out our faith privately 
and publicly at all times. We set the example of faith. And when we don't, we should never expect you to do that. I, as your pastor, shouldn't expect for you to be a soul reacher if I'm not going to go reach people who need Christ. I shouldn't expect for you to tithe. I shouldn't expect for you to serve. I shouldn't expect anything from you that I won't model and live out before you. And so you have to know this. God is equipping you to help me be equipped. God is preparing us as a body of believers to be thoroughly known by him. As an overseer, you have to know. God sees me privately as much as he sees you. Psalms 139 tells us that. I hope that you'll put that note in your Bible and go back to it. Because God knows us at all parts of our lives. Nothing is hidden. Nothing. Which means your pastor is equally responsible for his private life as you are. We don't get to be omitted from faith. We don't get to be omitted from practice. We can't just be pulpiteers. We have to live out the faith as well. So when Paul says, here is the criterion that an overseer must be, it matters that those that stand before you fit the criterion. They have to have some things. They have to be above reproach, the husband of one wife, self-controlled, sensible, respectable, hospitable, not an excessive drinker, not a bully, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not greedy. He should manage his household well. He shouldn't be a new convert. I want to stay here for just a second and let you know, those that lead you in faith should not be a brand new believer. The reason is, Paul urges them, what will happen is conceit will set in. Conceit will set in and you will believe that you are the greatest thing since sliced bread. By the way, before Betty White went to heaven, I I hope that she knew Christ, um, she was born before sliced bread. I, that's, that's unuseful. Hopefully that wins you will of fortune or jeopardy or whatever you go on. Who wants to be a millionaire? That was free for you. Anyways, born before sliced bread. A church leader must be deepening in his faith continually. I say he because I want you to know what this office that Scripture is talking about is. This overseer is one that sits over the top of the faith of a body of believers. Paul just urged them that he doesn't permit a woman to have authority over men in the church. And so now he's given that qualification that an overseer must be male. And we may not like that. We may not love that because culture is fighting this fight of, well, should women have every office a man has? And I want to tell you scripturally, Paul argues here that it shouldn't be. He doesn't say women can't be lawyers. He doesn't say they can't be doctors. He doesn't say they can't be senators. He just says inside the church, those that are overseeing the church should be male. And remember what we just read was because of God's order. God's order in the garden is he makes Adam, and Adam is toiling away on earth. And God looks at Adam and he says, it's not good that Adam is alone. I will provide for him a helpmate. Puts Adam to sleep, takes the rib, makes Eve. Adam and Eve, all of a sudden he looks at Eve and he goes, flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. And remember after the fall in the garden, Adam finally goes, and your name is Eve. You're like the mother of it all. And Eve was built to come alongside Adam in the garden, and they were going to toil together. At the curse, remember we talked last week, when the fall, when sin happened, one of the curses that God put on planet earth for sin was that from that time on, man and woman would fight for who was in charge. But it's not how God meant it to be. He meant for men to leave valiantly and with his heart. And he meant for women to come alongside their man and not be subservient, not to just be their yes woman, but to be a helpmate in everything. The problem is when sin happened, it fractured humanity. So that now inside the church even, we're making an argument for, should those that sit as overseer be male or female? And God's like, are you kidding me? Remember my design. 
How did I make this? Why are you trying to break this? Why does this not make sense to you? I had a design, and I'm begging you within the church, keep my design. Keep it. Be the best of my design. Don't be the worst. Don't fall the way the world does. Keep my design, and you will see what happens. Here is our issue. We all know overseers who fail. They're in our news. They're constantly failing around us. Overseers that have pursued an adulterous relationship, who have stolen money, who have done all sorts of kind of travesties. We see it always before us. And so we say to ourselves, well, maybe it's because it's a man. I will tell you this, an overseer will always fail you. You know why? Because they're just like you. The only difference is they have a calling or should have a calling to pursue God. And that calling out is not of themselves. A calling of God is not a man-made invention. A calling of God to pursue him in ministry is not man-centric. The office of an overseer, we get in this passage, is a desirable thing. Those that seek it, what does it say? And anyone that aspires to be an overseer, he desires noble work. But it doesn't say, and that makes him qualified, because he desires it. What this passage says is, even though you desire it, here's what you have to look like to do this. And if you don't, the office is not for you. Just because you're a man does not give you a pulpit. But then this isn't where it stops in these offices. Early in Acts, Acts chapter 6 Those that are toiling away at the ministry are overwhelmed by it. They have given up time spending studying and preparing, and now they're just doing the work of the ministry because the work of the ministry for an overseer will always overtake the study of God's Word. I want you to know, as the pastor at Quell Creek, the ministry takes 90% of my time. Study may get 10%. But I want you to know that is not how God intended it. God did not intend for pastors to do that much ministry. He intended for them to spend that much time with him so that you would hear only from him and not from 10% of me. Such that in Acts chapter 6, we get an inspirational moment where it said, women and men of this congregation, look from among you and find seven men of service. We're going to give them a title And we're going to ask them to do the work in the ministry so that those who are handling the word of God may spend more time doing that and less time doing the ministry. That may sound crazy to you because you hire a bunch of ministers. But what you should expect from our offices at Quell Creek is we're going to spend our time and our effort digging deeply into God's word and letting it saturate our souls so that when we're before any group within our church, we pour out from the overflow of Jesus within our lives. So in Acts chapter 6, these seven faithful men are given a title, servant. You may know it as diakonos or deacon, but they're just called the servants of this body. And so they start this institution. These seven men start doing the work that is overwhelming to those original apostles, and they faithfully hold this office. And we see that as we move into the church then, this early church movement, every one of these churches has these offices of elder, overseer, and deacons. And so Paul, when he's writing to Timothy, says this in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8, deacons likewise. He says, now you've heard about the overseer, now let me tell you about the deacon, should be worthy of respect, not hypercritical, not drinking a lot of wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of faith with a clear conscience. They must also be tested first. If they prove blameless, then they can serve as deacons. I want to stop here for a second and tell you that deacons in the church are not an ordinary group. They're given a title. This isn't, uh, let me just put it in our context here at the church. We have life group teachers. And praise God for that giftedness in our church. It's just not a biblical office. 
We've created that to better minister and to disciple you. But if you look on this list of offices of the church, that's not the next thing on the list. There's two offices, ordained by God, spoke through Paul, written to Timothy, and equipped through the church at Ephesus, overseer and deacon. These offices are special and distinct. God calls these offices to be in every church. I've been in churches where the deacons have become overseers. Instead of playing the role of equipping and helping those in that overseer role, they have taken an equal role of authority, and that's unbiblical. It's just not biblical. So at your church at Quell Creek, where you are today, our deacons gather together, and they meet together for some purposes. One, they ask the question, how can we help the pastors at Quell Creek? The next is, they reach out to that biblical model of widow in, the, in Acts chapter 6 and say, we're going to equip to take care of the widows of our church. Amen. But they never stop in how they serve or how they move. They always desire to make our job as pastors easier. Praise God for those faithful men in our church who are taking that role seriously and upholding it biblically to help our church be well taken care of. I want you to know what we're about to read in Scripture is the question that's been left for a long time. Now today, I, I could give you my thoughts, but I don't think my thoughts are necessary. So let's just let the Bible do what the Bible does. The Bible never contradicts itself. The Bible answers itself, and when we feel like it contradicts ourselves, it's a reader error and not a biblical one. So, are you ready to do some digging with me? 1 Timothy chapter 3, let's back up to verse 10. 1 Timothy 3, verse 10. They must be tested first. If they prove blameless, then they can serve as deacons. Wives, too, must be worthy of respect, not slanders, self-controlled, faithful in everything. Deacons are to be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own households completely. For those who served well as deacons acquire a good standing for themselves and great boldness in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Verse 11 um, is a moment where if you study Greek and you go to the original text, there's a word there that's lingered for history and no one knows why. Paul takes a breath and changes course. In verse 11... It says, likewise. Likewise. And why would the word likewise be in this passage? The problem that we have in Scripture is, this is a third thought. The question is, did Paul say wives or women? You see, the word in this Greek text is used both ways in the New Testament. Wives and women. And so you're going to find that people have an argument. And here's the argument. Should women be considered as deacons? Now, I want to give you some context. In the course of Scripture, diakonos is used 29 times. 26 of those are simply the term servant, including things like Romans 16.1 or Romans 15.8 where it talks about Christ. It says, you know, he came to be a servant, diakonos. And so there's parts of the passage that when we read servant, it it reads like deacon. Uh, But it's just not a good interpretation, correct? I mean, certainly Jesus wasn't a deacon to us. He was a diakonos. He was a servant. And he, he claims that through Scripture. But then we read on in the passages as we come to an interesting person, In Romans 16, 1, this won't be on the screen, Paul commends a woman named Phoebe as a servant of her church. And he uses the word diakonos. Was Phoebe a deacon? Let me clarify this for you. Let's go back to the word again. Diakonos, in this passage, is a verb. It means to serve. 
And in this passage with Phoebe, it says she is serving the church. She is diakonosing the church. It gives her the title of a servant. In this passage that we're reading today, diakonos is a noun. It means a deacon, a servant. Not serving, a servant. Now, I'm not here to give you exactly what this means or the text. I, listen, if God would give this inspiration, I would gladly give it to you. But I believe Scripture is read in context. I think when we read Scripture, we need to let Scripture be Scripture. Amen. And in this passage, we get some identifiers. Acts chapter 6 again. If we go back to that passage, we're reminded that who did they ask to choose? Seven who? Men. Then we get to our passage today in 1 Timothy. It gives a qualification of these deacons, and it says that he should be the husband of one wife. I want you to know something. Do I believe that we have women at the church at Quell Creek that are great diaconos? Amen to that. Yes, of course we do. We have women who serve faithfully. I believe that deacons are not people who seek that office. Remember, we get that there's a trustworthy thing. If anyone seeks to be an overseer, I don't read that with the course of deacons. It doesn't say, and here's a trustworthy saying, anyone that seeks to be a deacon seeks an awesome office. It doesn't read that way, does it? I think deacons are found because they're serving. Amen. Deacons are found diakonosing their church so they can be diakonos of the church. Amen. They're actively verbing so they can become a noun. So let me answer it like this. If you studied a hundred years and you went to any source you could find, great scholars in the faith on either side of this, they make sense. They make sense. You take some great authoritative authors that I read all the time and they will tell you that what Paul is arguing in this passage in verse 11 is therefore likewise, and he's telling you likewise women should be considered as deacons. Then you read the next author, and he says that's not what it means at all. It means that women, for both context, in deacon and overseer, should be considered these things to be qualified. I will tell you this. There is never a qualification for wives of overseers in this passage. Don't you think that's strange? That we would get qualifications for deacon's wives? but not for overseers' wives? I mean, I would argue that there should be a million qualifications for the wife of an overseer more than there should be for the wife of a deacon. Wouldn't you? If God's going to give qualifications, I think he should do it for those that are pastoring and leading churches. Why didn't he do that? Did Paul just think that these overseers would all be single? That's not what he says. There should be the husband of one wife. So why doesn't he give qualifications for that wife? Why didn't he say, oh, by the way, you overseers, here's the list for your wives. Why does he only do it for the deacon's wife? Do you see why this is complicated yet? Do you see why this is a divine juggling match of understanding? I have my thoughts. I have my theories. But I want you to know something. Anytime a pastor tells you what God meant, he shouldn't preach. Wow, amen. It should either be God's thoughts or nothing. Amen. So, moving on. Um, a church leader should be diligent in their seeking. First Peter 5 tells us this. I exhort you, the elders, the pastors, the leaders among you, as fellow elder and witness to the sufferings of Christ, as well as one who shares in the glory about to be revealed, Shepherd God's flock among you, not overseeing out of compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not out of greed for money, but eagerly, not lording over it with those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you'll receive the unfading crown of glory in the same way. You who are younger, be subject to the elders. All of you clothe yourselves with humility towards one another, because God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. 
Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your cares on him because he cares about you. Be sober-minded. Be alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion, looking for anyone he can devour. Resist him, firm in the faith, knowing the same kind of sufferings are being experienced by your fellow believers throughout the world. The God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, establish, strengthen, and support you after you have suffered a little while. To him be the dominion forever. Amen. Amen. As one of those people who has the calling, I, I felt that calling into the ministry, but I ran from it. I, I want you to know, I, I knew as a teenager that God was calling me into ministry. I just didn't want to be a minister. I didn't want to be a minister because I saw what it looked like. I don't know about you, but if you went to a hot dog factory today, even if you like hot dogs, and, and I do, and you watch the process of a hot dog being made, I challenge you, look it up on YouTube. Eat after. Um, but you watched it being made, you would go, hmm, I don't know if I'm going to eat a hot dog anymore. What comes out before it goes into the casing is... Nothing short of, ugh. And I want you to know, as a preacher's kid, that's how I felt about the church. Because I loved my pastor. He was my dad. And I watched what the ministry looked like as it was being made. And I just went, ugh. And so I went to school on a Christian leadership scholarship And I wanted to be a coach because I thought if I was called to at least work around students, I'd just be a coach and not being in church world was fine with me. I was going to go to church. In fact, the first Sunday at the Baptist University that I went to, I got up that morning and I was the only one in my hall that got up and went to church. In my soul and in my heart, I knew God had a calling on my life. I just didn't want to pursue it. Because in my heart, I thought I was better than the church. I thought I worshiped better than our church. I served better than our church. I knew better than our church. I watched full-grown adult men act like Satan in private and angels in public. And it made me angry. I've said it before, a man offended my father one time, and one of my best buddies and I sat down the block with pocket knives in our hands, ready to puncture his tires just to prove that we were better than him. I was ready to not pursue Jesus at all in ministry. And I discovered every part of my life where I chose to do what I wanted to do instead of what God called me to do, ruined, like bad fruit. For a season, it looked good, and I had jobs in a secular world where I was making incredible money. April and our young marriage, I I was making these incredible paychecks, and I was like, this is it, babe, we've arrived, and then showed up that next day and was let go for the sake of bringing in staff they already had. It led us to a town called Fred, where we served at a church that frankly, was so different than us. And I got to tell you, as soon as we got there, we were like, what are we doing here? And then we discovered we were there because Jesus brought us to Fred. Then a hurricane happened. And the Lord led us to a place called Farwell. And to working in a ministry that changed dramatically within months. And we were mad. But God called, and he changed us. And then God led us to a place called Amarillo, to a church called the Church at Quell Creek. And in that movement, we didn't understand it, and we didn't know why. Because we left a place we loved with people that we loved, with friends that we had built in. But we followed Jesus because he said, follow me. And we did. The question I have to you today is this. It's been a long time at Quell Creek, 
since men and women answered the call of Christ to follow him in ministry. And I believe God has called some of you for years, and you've run. And you, like I did, felt like we could run like Jonah. (laughs) But we discovered that every step that we've taken has led us only to the belly of a whale. I want to thoroughly encourage you today. If God has called you, if he is calling you, you can't do anything else. You can't be ordinary. Students in this room, hear me. If God has called you into the ministry, you can't do ordinary things. You can't go to ordinary schools. You can't be taught ordinarily. You need to be equipped because you will stand before people who need to hear from Jesus. And God has called you. Don't be ordinary. Adults in this room, whether you're 92 or you're 27, hear me in this. If God has called you, you need to quit running. You need to be obedient to the call that Jesus has put on your life and step forward and declare it today. I know that God has a call on my life, and I don't know what to do next, but I can't do anything else because he's called me, and I'm going to pursue him. Quit running from the calling of God. His voice is bigger than your run. Here's my last thought. When I was in high school, I went to a school where band was the biggest thing on school campus. You could be an athlete and play any sport you wanted. Or you could be a non-athlete and do nothing. But everybody was in band. From eighth grade year to senior year, everybody in the school was in the band. It was a little 2A town in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the oil patch. And that little band would show up at any game anywhere and fill the field full of students to a school. To put this in perspective for you, I would argue that when I was in school at that band, our band was as large, if not larger, than most 4A bands and just as loud. But everybody came and was a part of the band. And the reason is, it was the greatest thing that we could participate in that joined the whole campus together. At this place, at Quell Creek, the greatest thing that you could belong to, the greatest thing that unifies us, is Jesus. I want to tell you something. My prayer and my hope is that there is not a person here today that leaves this room without knowing Jesus as their Lord and Savior. It is the greatest unifier I could ever tell you in this planet Earth. I cannot imagine life without Jesus in it. Can't. This world is too awful. The news is too incredibly saddening. And the outcome of our economy is... But this is not the home that Jesus built for us. That's heaven. And for God so loved the world, he gave everybody opportunity through Jesus that if you would believe in him, you would not simply perish. You wouldn't just take your last breath here and then nothing because that is never the outcome, but that you would have eternal life. But there's a wage of sin. Our sin, anything that we would do that we know is wrong, that we know is anti-God and his nature, the wages of that is death. The price of your sin is death. And for the rest of your life, you can live with it. God gives you that opportunity today to hear these words of mine and choose to not accept him and believe in him as Savior and Lord. You can choose that. And you can leave this room knowing that Jesus died for you. He died for the sins. And the Bible says we all have had sin and fallen short of glory of God. We all, you and I both, we've all sinned. We've all done it. Whether it was a small lie or you stole a Corvette, or you killed your neighbor. Whatever sin that might have been, we've all done it, and it all separates us from God. And the price of that is eternal death. The Bible says that he made a place for his enemy, the devil. It's a place called hell, and it was built for him. But anybody willfully knowing Christ and chooses not to accept him as Savior and Lord becomes that enemy. You choose to partner with the enemy. 
God didn't build hell for people. He built it for his enemy. But when you choose to not accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that's who you are. And today, you have a choice. It is always before you, life or death. And Christ says, I have come that they may not only have life, but have it in abundance. Belief through faith and repentance. I repent of the sins that I've committed. I believe who you say you are. And you are saved by grace through faith. You can't even build it on your own. He has lavished grace out like a welcoming mat and says, whosoever will may come. Today, I hope you're in the band. I hope you are a singer of songs and a dreamer of dreams. But that only happens with participation in Jesus, not in the church, in Christ alone. Today, do you know him? Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, we've talked about the offices of the church. And that's a difficult thought, God. Lord, we want to live out our faith the way you wanted us to. Lord, when the world looks at the church and its offices, they notice when it's done incorrectly. And so, Lord, we want our church, the church at Quell Creek, to look exactly like you said it should in Scripture. And so, Lord, help us to refine the offices. Help us to know you deeply, God. We want to pursue you with all we have, with all we know, with all we do. Lord, would you forgive us where we've short-sighted that? Lord, would you forgive us for the times that we should have committed our lives to you and believed in you, but we haven't? But today, Lord, may this be a day where we put a stake in the ground and declare we are completely yours. Lord, for my friends in this room that have been called to pursue you in ministry, may they never step aside from it. May they never let it just sit on the the shelf and dwindle away. But God, may they pursue your calling deeply to be different, to be changed. And God, would you send out the next generation of ministers from the church at Quell Creek. God, would you equip this time? Would your spirit fall? And may we be obedient to it now. Lord, we pray this in the holy and precious name of Jesus. Amen.